Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Lord. I'm an alcoholic. Katie. <clears throat> um, on May 7th of 2015, I was separated from alcohol and all other mood-altering substances uh, by the power of God. Um, and I have since recovered from alcoholism. And when that happened in my life at that time, I think exactly no people expected that to occur, um, least of all myself. Um, I'm just really excited to be here. When Sean asked me to speak, um, he said, Katie, do you want to speak at PPW? And I said, yes. And then I asked him, what's PPW? <laughs> because I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know, you know the abbreviation. And he told me, he told me what it was. And it's a workshop that I'm familiar with. And the next thing that I said was like, are, are you sure? Um, because this is the same event that years ago my, my sponsor would try to drag me to, you know, when I was unwilling to take direction and when I was kind of living in a place that precedes step one. She would try to get me to come here, and I would, I would come, and I would hang out for, you know, 30 minutes, and I would leave as soon as I could because I had better things to do, like trying to manage my own life. Um, and she would ask me to listen to, to speaker tapes, and including our main speaker's tapes uh, tonight, and uh, I would tell her that I'd listened to them, and I hadn't. Um, so it's... It's just really fourth dimensional to be asked to speak at the primary purpose workshop, and I'm very happy to be here. So welcome if you're new. We're really glad that you're here. Um, it doesn't seem like very long ago that I was new, um, so I, I absolutely know what that's like. Um, there's a lot that happened up to, uh, up to the point where, where I recovered, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but what I'm most excited to talk about tonight is what happened to me inside of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, because it's a lot more than I expected. It's, it's not what I expected. Um, when I first came to AA, I thought that one thing needed to change, and it wasn't a change that I was very excited about. I thought that the, the thing that needed to happen was that I needed to stop getting loaded, and then everything would be okay. And I was, I was terrified of that. It sounded awful. I couldn't imagine a world in which I didn't drink anymore. Um, and what I came to find out is that everything would change. Um, and in fact, everything would have to change. Uh, or there was no world in which I wouldn't be getting loaded anymore. Um, so when I was a kid, <clears throat> I don't really know that a great deal about my childhood is terribly pertinent. Uh, aside from one fact, which is that uh, I was born with alcoholism in my genetic code. Uh, my mom was raised by an alcoholic father, uh, so there was alcoholism on her side, and there was also some alcoholism on my father's side, so it was all over the place. Um, and, and aside from that, I had a really average normal childhood. In fact, I had um, you know, a lot of advantages. I went to private schools. I had, I had parents who loved me, who gave me a lot of opportunities. Um, I was well cared for. I didn't experience any trauma, and you know, on the flip side, if I had uh the same primary fact would be the one fact that matters. I, I had alcoholism in my DNA. It was, I had a predisposition to alcoholism that I was born with, um, and that was made manifest when I took my first drink. Um, and, you know, I, I, prior to taking my first drink, I really didn't, I didn't really think that there was anything out of the ordinary about me. I didn't, I didn't really notice much. I, I remember being really self-aware. Um, and introspective, and I was constantly keep, just kind of keeping score on how I was doing in terms of getting what I wanted, which I thought was like the guiding force in everyone's life. I thought that everyone was governed by this, but governed by this one feature: like we're all just here to get as much of what we want as possible and as little of what we don't want. Um, and that was kind of like the theme. Um, and it's funny because I can remember like being a kid, being you know in middle school, and thinking about how fortunate I was. I had a lot of things going for me. Um, and I would make these lists of all the things that were going well. And like, at one point, I remember thinking, I wonder what the catch is. Like, is there going to be a catch? Because I'm really set up to have a good life here. Um, you know, and spoiler alert, um, alcoholism was the catch. So, um, which wasn't a surprise to, to, to my mother. And, um, but I didn't know what alcoholism was. All, all that I knew is that I took my first drink when I was a sophomore in high school, and I didn't know what it stood to offer me. And so I, I don't think I even finished. I got maybe a third of the way into a beer, just enough to kind of feel experience a whisper of what was there, and then I, and then I stopped. 
because I was also a kid who was really interested in um, making sure that everybody liked me and that, that I wasn't in trouble and that things were going okay. Um, and later, the drinks that worked, the first drinks that worked, they just really blend into one for me because these were private experiments that occurred in my home. Um, I drank liquor that was in my home. I felt the effects, and it was in that moment the course of my life shifted into a new direction because it was just so awesome. It was just so amazing, you know. I couldn't believe that everyone who had been cautioning me against drinking was so full of it because it was, it was great news that here, here's a thing that I can put this in my body, the effects are produced, and, and we're off. Um, and so it, it just became about more of that. Um, as much of it as I could get with, you know, while being cautious to limit the consequences. Uh, and that would be the number one thing in my life um, for a very long time. And right away I noticed that when I drank, um, I couldn't reliably control how much I drank. Um, that was apparent to me right away. Um, and, I, and I really wasn't alarmed by it. I just thought maybe I hadn't figured it out yet. Uh, and so on through the years we went, um, and there's a lot I'm going to kind of skip, uh, but I started to have problems with interpersonal relationships, problems with my parents, uh, problems with losing control, and just abhorrent behavior. Um, the book's description of the real alcoholic has always fit me to a T. It wasn't difficult for me to identify with that. Uh, I would drink. I would lose control. I would drink more than I wanted to. I would find myself in a place where I could no longer control for consequences. Uh, I could no longer decide where the night was going to take me, what was going to happen next, what I was going to do, what I was going to say, and then that started to, to create problems for me right away. Uh, and it was a very long time before I stopped to consider the fact that it might not be possible to figure out a way of controlling for those consequences. I just thought there was something that I was missing and that I would learn in time to do what I saw people around me doing, which was drink and have a great time and enjoy alcohol the way that I enjoyed alcohol and not have problems. Um, by the time I was in my early 20s, it became clear that that probably wasn't going to happen. Um, there was less and less control as time went by and never more. Um, and of course, at that time, I didn't have any framework. I didn't have any understanding of what, what alcoholism was, what an alcoholic was. I thought alcoholism was something that you happened into as a result of many different features and factors in, in your life. I thought that it was a result of trauma. It was the result of having things that you needed to escape. Um, I thought that you had to be older to be an alcoholic. I thought that you, know, you became an alcoholic when you were older. Um, and I had a lot of preconceived notions about what that, what that was. And so I, I really never thought that I had alcoholism. It didn't occur to me. I would start to say things like, I have, I've got a drinking problem. <laughs> I don't, when I drink thing, you know, I get a little crazy. Um, and I continued to destroy relationships and I continued to manufacture problems for myself. Um, and I tried a lot of different means of getting that under control. Because uh, I loved alcohol, but I was also game for anything that you had that would uh, give me the ability to, to uh, produce an effect. Anything that you had I that would produce that effect, I would put it in my body. And so drugs are a part of my story. Um, and I don't think that that matters uh, as, as much as sometimes we think it does. Because if drugs had never been a part of my story, I still would be here with the exact same predicament. Because I, I, had, I had a relationship with alcohol that normal people don't have. Um, I lacked control and I lacked choice. Um, and it's that second piece that I really struggle with later on. Um, at a certain point, I, I got pregnant. I had children. I got married. I thought... I'll just do well, I'll be a good wife, I'll be a good mother, I love my children, um, I'll change the way that my life looks, and then I'll be able to get this under control. And that kind of marked the, my first attempts at getting sober. Because um, it, it had be, begun to become apparent that I, if I were to keep relationships in my life, if I wanted to keep certain relationships in my life, then I was going to have to do something. Um, and I had kind of given up on the idea that I would be able to find a way to get loaded successfully in a way that would be deemed accept acceptable by the people in my life. Um, so it's the first time. I'm in my early 20s, and I'm, I'm trying, to get, trying to get sober. And I could get sober. I could do that, um, especially given the way that I would spree drink and create problems. I would come up out of an experience, and I was demoralized, and I was afraid, and I was embarrassed. Um, and I would get sober. And then what would happen is that no matter what I wanted and no matter what I said and no matter what I thought, 
And no matter how hard I tried to position myself in a way that would make it possible for me to stay sober, I would just not stay sober, though. And I, and I, I thought that that was maybe for a lot of reasons. Maybe I don't want it bad enough. Maybe uh, I'm just making bad choices, you know. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Um, I went to treatment several times. Um, and, and, and as the years went by and the consequences got more extreme, I started to, to really, at least in, in certain moments, develop an extreme desire, a real desire to be sober. But I just couldn't keep it. And I couldn't explain that either. Because as badly as I would want to be sober in one moment, I would find myself in another in, in short time where I just didn't, though. I didn't want to be sober anymore. And that was almost unmentionable. You couldn't say that to the people in your lives or in your life who had been harmed by you. You know, that wasn't something that I could turn and say to my to my parents or to my then husband or anybody around me. I couldn't couldn't tell them that, but right now I don't want to be sober. <laughs> and so I developed, you know, a mode of secrecy, which was very in line with my first experiences with alcohol. This was my private world. Like I, I didn't need it to be anybody else's. I had a relationship with alcohol that was sufficient all by itself as a solution for everything. Um, and I loved it more than I, than I dared admit to anybody around me. Um, and so, you know, things started to, to kind of intensify. Um, and I was about 24 um, and we were living in a small town in Kansas and raising two very small children whom I love very much. And uh, the threats are starting to get pretty significant. I'm, you know, I'm not able to stay sober. I'll get sober. Everybody's hopes kind of rise. Everyone's like, okay, she's going to be, she's going to do it this time. She's finally got it figured out. And, and I would start to, you know, put everything back together and everything looks okay. And then I would do it again. Uh, and it was a bigger disaster than before. Um, <coughs> And so I'm being told, you know, for the first time that y you have these children who you love and you're a great mother when you're sober, but if you're not going to be sober, then you're not going to be able to see them. That's the way it's going to be. You know, my husband was explaining that he would have to leave and he would take the kids, and I believed him. And now, now I really wanted to get it together. I, I don't know that I ever wanted to be sober, but I, I knew that I needed to be because I was, it was, I was pretty clear on the fact that I lacked control. <coughs> Every time I drank, I couldn't reliably control what happened. Um, and so I made some serious efforts. Like I, I went to longer-term treatments. I, I tried to put myself in the best position, and I believed that that would work, that I could go to rehab like you see on TV. I could go there. They would fix me. I would come out, and then I would be better. We would get down to the nitty-gritty of you know, my problems and, and whatever, my, the, my inner workings, and I would figure out why it is that I do this. And then I would know and then I could guard against it. Um, and that is not what happened. Um, and so I started to find myself into some, in some legal trouble. And when I talk about the legal trouble, I think it's really important to, to mention that, you know, the external circumstances just aren't a qualifying or diagnostic feature for determining whether or not we have alcoholism. Because had I not experienced the external consequences that I had, and my story looked very, very different, as they all do, I still would be a person who, who lacks control and lacks choice. And that's the way that we diagnose alcoholism. So it's important to not get distracted by, you know, that, that isn't what my story looks like. That didn't happen to me. Um, because I used to do a lot of that when I would come to AA. I would hear people talk about things that, ha that, they, that they had done and losses that they had endured, and that wasn't a part of my experience. I was just at home hiding beer cans behind the paint in the basement so that my husband didn't get mad at me. And nothing had happened yet, aside from feeling really depressed and really afraid um, and causing a lot of wreckage. Uh, but nevertheless, I continued to relapse despite my desire to stay sober. Um, and I thought that I could, that I could navigate, that I, I could prevent certain consequences from befalling me, and I was wrong because that's the nature of, of the lack of control. We just can't tell what's going to happen, um, and we won't see it coming because I was a private school kid who would have sworn that my life wouldn't look like it did between 2010 and 2015, and it did. Um, so in 2014, at this time, I had been in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, despite deciding that AA didn't have much to offer me, I thought that when I heard you guys talk about God um, and service and um, 
and all of that, that it just, it wouldn't, it couldn't possibly be sufficient to, to help me to stay sober. I didn't think that that's what I needed. I had a lot of ideas about what I needed, but when I came to AA, despite the, the kind of conviviality and the, the belonging that I felt when I would be in a meeting, I scoffed at the solution that was presented for a very long time. Um, and my first real entry into AA kind of happened in 2010. I, I acquired a sponsor. She presented me with some work. I did a little bit of it, and then I, I, I left um, because I wasn't able to stay sober because I never finished the work. Um, I was never interested in spirituality or, or surrender or anything of that nature. Um, so for four years, I was in and out, and at a certain point in there, I developed a relationship with a woman who I asked to sponsor me. Um, and a fellowship of people who were doing AA out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and I, I would come in and I would come out, um, and while they didn't nurse my sprees, they always welcomed me back, and each, on each occasion they worked with me. Um, on each occasion I was offered help. I didn't have to chase help down. They approached me. Uh, they offered the solution. They carried the message. Um, and it didn't matter that it was going in one ear and out the other or over my head. I, I would wind up in AA again and again despite my, intent, my best intentions. Even though I didn't want to be here, I kept finding myself here because it was the only place in the world where people weren't mad at me. So I would, I would show up because everybody's mad and I'm going to go to an AA meeting because that's where people are sober and everyone's mad because I'm not. Um, and so... Uh, I acquired sponsorship, and I was offered the work again. And uh, I made another run, 30 or 60 days. Things were starting to improve at home. Uh, and uh, it was my birthday. It was March in 2014, and um, I, it was just a passing thought. It just came out of nowhere. It's your birthday. It would be nice. Mm -hmm. And that was it. We were off. Um, and, I, and I was getting loaded again and just very, de very deceitful. I could not tell anybody the truth. These were private sprees. So I'm off with whoever, it, you know, who, that nobody else knows. Um, and we're doing what we do. And I ended up in some very serious legal trouble for the first time. Um, I was involved in some property crime. And I was arrested and charged with a felony. And that was a problem because I knew that felonies were a big deal. And I'm going to be in big trouble here. And, oh, no, what's going to happen? And, um... And what happened was my husband divorced me and took my children and moved to Kansas overnight. So overnight, I went from having a home and a place that I lived to being homeless um, and facing a felony charge. Um, and you would think that that would be enough. Now, now it's time to buckle down and take this direction that I'm being given. But no, um, I still thought that I knew better. And I still thought that Alcoholics Anonymous was going to be like every other venture in my life. I'll take the textbook and I'll read through it, and I'll pick which parts I'm going to use so that I can pass the test, and then that's that. I didn't think that it was something that was an all or nothing. I thought that it would be like everything else, and that I could cut corners, and that it could be an extracurricular activity, and that I could use it to my advantage to figure out how to manage my life and get what I wanted. Um, and every time I was told that that's not what's happening here, it just missed me. I just, it, didn't, it didn't register. Um, and so matters grew worse, uh, and I spent the better part of 2014 in and out of in and out of jail. Every time I would come out, I would find myself in the company of people that I had picked up along the way um, in treatment facilities. People people that didn't didn't know anything about me aside from the fact that I like to get drunk and I like to get high, and that's what we would do together. Um, and I would lie to everybody in my life who loved me. I would you know live in Oxford houses and run those Oxford houses and do drugs in my bedroom, and nobody knew. And that was kind of my MO, was just like, I don't have to tell the truth, because this is about getting what I want. This is about figuring out how to get what I want, and, how, and about figuring out how to keep the things in my life that I want, and discard of the rest, and do so with the most minimal effort. Um, and it, it wasn't that I wasn't told. I had so many opportunities to sit with people who were doing their part in the 12th step, and who didn't assume that I knew what alcoholism was. They took the time to explain to me what it meant to be alcoholic and to explain to me what that meant for me if I were alcoholic. No one pronounced me an alcoholic, even though if ever there were a case where it would have been appropriate, it was probably mine. They left me to my own conclusions. Um, so I knew that the root of my troubles was selfishness and self-centeredness, 
I had been told that the, that the drinking was a symptom, that that wasn't the issue, um, and I just couldn't concede to it. I just still continued to try to make AA about getting what I wanted. Um, and so uh, in 2015, um, things were really intense. I had two pending felony cases. Um, and what had happened was I had made this habit of just telling everybody a lie about what it was that I was doing and who it was that I was and whether or not I was sober. Um, and, and I had lost, just so lost touch with the ability to be honest. Um, and at a certain point in time in, in March of 2015, uh, the, the police elected to put me on the news. And it was, it was a really important turning point in my life. <laughs> because... I had been just so dishonest, and you know this is what I'm doing, and this is what I'm about, and it's it's wrong that you won't let let me see my children. You should let me see my children because I have been sober for such a such amount of time, and and the, here comes the news report, and it's my face, and they said this is Katie, and she's 28 years old, and she's five foot two, and she's been breaking into houses, and we'd like her to stop. And, and that's what she's been doing. Um, and so everybody knew. And, and it was, like, terrifying. And at the same time, I remember experiencing this strange sensation of relief. Just that, okay, <laughs> everybody knows. You know? <clears throat> everybody knows, and that's that. And there's not a lot you can do about that now. Um, and so I tried to run away, and they, they followed me, and they, they put me back in, in jail where I should be. And uh, before that moment and the moment when my life changed, there was another release and another arrest. And each time I got out and everyone said, my God, like, it's time. Are you going to do the work in AA? It's time. And everybody was, you know, hopeful <laughs> that I would, but I think that they, they expected that I wouldn't because I had such a lengthy track record of being offered a solution and just declining it. Uh, so between the months of April and May, just one month, 30 days, I had one job. I was out on an expensive bond. Uh, I was not allowed to see my children. All that I needed to do was stay sober. That's it. Just stay sober and stay out of trouble. If you don't stay sober, you won't stay out of trouble. So we have to stay sober. Uh, and that I was able to do that for about 10 days. And then I was back at it again. Um, each time thinking, I'll, I'll, I'll stop in time. I'll, you know, I'll stop before anybody finds out. I will get it together. I will, I will figure it out. Um, I'll know when it gets too bad. Um, and I was involved, you know, with, with pretty serious drugs at this point, as well as alcohol. Um, and I was getting closer to death than I, than I think I knew at the time. It wasn't something that I was conscious of. But the people who, who knew me were. I, had, I have a younger brother who, who came into AA and introduced me to the group where I found sponsorship and where I found help. And, and he was, I remember the look on his face. And it was really the only time that it registered that they, they explained, I, it had been explained to me that alcoholism was a terminal and chronic illness and that I would either accept spiritual help or I would die an alcoholic death. And I would have no say in, in when that alcoholic death arrived for me. Um, and it was right there. I mean, it was right around the corner. It was very, very serious. Um, and, and I don't know whether or not I didn't care or, or whether or not that was just the level of delusion and just the level of the inability to differentiate the true from the false. I just couldn't tell what was real anymore. All that I knew was that I needed to get loaded. This is what I need to do to be okay. And even when I want to stop, it couldn't matter less because uh, I continue to find myself in a place where I'm doing it no matter what. Um, and and the, this, this explanation that the book offers on page 52 about this condition, this thing that's inside me that creates this experience of restlessness and, and this feeling of uselessness and these problems that won't go away and this depression and this disconnection from everyone and this wanting to be somewhere else no matter where I'm at. Um, I wasn't able to, to be rid of that reliably with drugs and alcohol anymore. I mean, I could sometimes, but the cost on it was so high that I would come up out of there and the condition would be worse. Um, and the only solution I had ever known was to continue to get loaded. And what's crazy is that 
you know, I did love people. I loved my children. I loved my parents. I loved my friends. I wanted to be a person who had a life. All that I wanted in the whole world was to get loaded the way that I get loaded and also be a person who had a real life. And those things were mutually exclusive, no matter how hard I tried. And I was obsessed with making that happen. Somehow, I'll make it happen. I'll be able to go to work and have a job and make a living and take care of my kids and have a good reputation and also do this in the basement when I say so. And it just never worked. Um, so I had attended a few meetings with the people who I had come to love, uh, the people who, who, who remained in AA, who were there every time I came back, who were demonstrating a degree of stability that, that I envied and respected. Um, and we spoke, and it was clear that I was in a grim situation. And uh, there was an offer made that, that I, could, I could get a ride to detox. Katie will take you to detox. And when you get out, we'll help you get into a living environment that's safe for you, and you can do AA if you want to. And so I accepted the offer, um, and I went to detox on May 5th of 2015, and this, the stage was set. Uh, I, I, had, I had everything I needed to come out and do it. You know, I'm going to do AA now. And, and I wanted to the day that I went. And I got in there. And I sat, and I smoked some cigarettes for two or three hours, and I just could not stay. Like, I tried to sit on my hands. I, try, I tried everything. I just couldn't. My head wouldn't be quiet about, let's just do it tomorrow. Like, this is really hard. Let's just go. Let's go back out one more time. Let's get right so we don't feel so sick, and we'll come back in, and we'll do it tomorrow. What's the difference? And so I left. Um, and it was very strange because within 30 minutes of leaving, it's almost as if I knew because I can remember taking my sweatshirt and just putting it over my face and just heaving just with hopelessness because no matter how many times I found myself in a situation where, where here we go, it's all set, we can, we can do this now, no matter how many times, I just kept cheating myself out of it. I just kept convincing myself, let's go do it again. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, and so I prayed. It was about all I could do. The only piece of direction that was, that was available to me in the moment, I, and I remember it. I remember my sponsor who had grown, just, she just didn't know what to do because I kept asking her for help and then I wouldn't take the help. But she, she said that I should ask God to make me willing, make me willing to be willing no matter what it costs. And so I remember praying that prayer. Um, as we're driving, as we're driving to get high, and God, please make me willing, no matter what it costs. Um, and that was all I could do. And uh, later that night, we, uh, my companion and I, went to the hospital to try to obtain some pain medication, uh, and that didn't work out so well. And uh, and as we were leaving, we noticed that the uh, the pharmacy was closed and unattended. So we. We went into the pharmacy and um, through the drywall with our fists. <laughs> and we took as much medication as we could. We bundled it up into plastic bags and we threw it back through the hole like, you know, the carnival game with the football, except not as fun. And, um, and then we, we ran off into the night. And the next day I woke up very, very confused um, and lucky to be alive. Um, and the cops were there. And that was that. And this time... This time I'm not getting out. Um, and this is the moment. They asked me questions, and I told them the truth. I was so tired. Um, and I was just so afraid, you know, because it was never supposed to go like this. I had a nice life. Everything was supposed to be okay. I was supposed to find my way out of here. How did we get here? How did we get to a place where we're this person? Um, and so uh, I found myself in Sarpy County um, with an, uh, a pretty crazy bond that nobody was going to pay. Um, and there wasn't anybody on the face of the planet who would take my calls, except for a few members of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was it. Uh, but they would. They would take my calls. And I remember in the few, first few days, I behaved like an animal. Um, I was terrified and desperate because... I am in control of nothing. Um, 
and uh, they showed me to my room, and uh, my room is like a cement room, and there's a, a metal shelf that comes out from the wall. It's a metal shelf. And then on the metal shelf is the blue mat that they give you in kindergarten to take a nap on, except it's been through hell. I mean, it's just, it's shredded, and they give you one wool blanket, which seems as if it's been purposefully constructed to be as itchy as possible. <laughs> and that's your bed. There, this is where you live now. Um, indefinitely because I'm in some serious trouble. So I know that after this stay, there's likely to be another. I have absolutely no say on what the consequences will be, and I can't get loaded anymore. And it was unbearable. It was unbearable. Like, I remember some of the phone calls I made just, ho like, howling about, like, please, please get me out of here. you got to get me out of here. And I remember one in particular uh, where the AA on the other line, I told him how afraid I was, and he threw back his head and laughed. Because it was just so insane. But here, here I am, and I'm finally safe. I haven't been safe in years. And here I am, and I'm finally safe, and now I'm terrified. I'm just so, so afraid. And that was, like, among the things that I appreciated the most about, about the people who were working the 12th step in my life. Just this levity. That, that they could talk to me with a sense of humor that helped me to consider the possibility that maybe we didn't need to take the details of my life so seriously today. Maybe it's not so serious. Maybe we just need to calm down and have a sense of humor. And that did a lot for me. Um, and at the same time, they treated my condition with the deadly seriousness that it deserved because I was a dying person. And it was more likely than anything else that I wouldn't survive. And they did what they always did. They offered me the work. We, ha we have one solution. We don't have another. Here's what it is. Out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, nothing fancy. Um, and after I had physically detoxed, I remember being on my shelf bed and, um, and just considering for a moment what a poor job I had been doing of trying to manage my life. I had been trying to stick to self-sufficiency. And the, and the worse I fought to have my own way, the worse matters got. And that was abundantly clear um, and I was also able for the first time ever and I think as the result of God's grace to see the relationship between knowing God and staying sober which wasn't something that I had ever seen before that if I'm to stay sober I will know God I have to know God or I won't stay sober and so it stopped being about doing what I needed to do to stay sober and it started being about finding God because I believe for the first time in my life that perhaps that was the last thing that I had left available to me. It was the only thing that I had tried. I had not tried. And, and despite whatever preconceived notions or prejudices that I had about spiritual things, what I felt in my core was that there had better be a power. Like I needed there to be a power or I wasn't going to make it. I knew that if they ever let me out, I would do what I had always done. Um, and so I got down on my knees and, I, and I, I begged God to take my life. You can have my life. And if you allow me to recover, and if you allow me to feel your presence, then I will do everything that I can to make sure that other, other people have the same opportunity. I will tell everyone, just please, please help me, because I don't know what to do. Um, and it was very sincere, which wasn't something that I had, a lot, I had a lot of prior to that moment in my life. I didn't have a lot of sincerity going on, but I did in that moment. Um, and, and right away, immediately, things started to, to change. The way that I perceived things started to change, and it was very, very shocking to me. Uh, and I remember calling my brother the next day and telling him, I don't know why I feel like this, but I, I think I might be okay. It was very surprising. Um, and I immediately began writing a fourth step. So I wrote a fourth-step inventory while I was in jail. My sponsor took time out of her life to come sit with me through a pane of glass and hear my inventory um, at like three, four weeks over. And when I was finished with that, we talked about steps six and seven. I continued to develop a prayer and meditation life. I would go up into my little cell and I would read anything that they would give me that had to do with God, anything. Um, and... Uh, I began to make whatever amends I could. Um, I wrote letters. When people would come to see me, I would, I would talk to them about the way that I harmed them and ask them if there was anything that I could do to make that right. Um, 
And at about six weeks sober, I called my sponsor one day and she told me that uh, that there were alcoholics there who were going to need help. And so I had done everything else that she had asked and it didn't matter what I felt. Uh, I, I went to it and lo and behold, there were plenty of alcoholics there. Uh, <laughs> the first woman that I ever sponsored uh, was there with me. She asked me for help while we were there and she's here tonight. Um, I haven't seen her in a while, but she's here tonight. In the hallway out there, I ran into another woman that I was in, I was in Sarpy County with. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about alcoholism and about our lives, and I haven't seen her in a long time either. Um, and I, I mean, anybody who, who, who came in and indicated that they had issues with alcoholism that brought, or, or alcohol and drug use that brought them in here, we would talk about it. Just out of the book, just like my sponsor had done with me, we would talk about, do you have alcoholism? Let's figure that out first. And if they thought that they did, I would ask them if they wanted to read the book with me. We'd go and we would sit on the cement floor and we would read. Um, listen, like, I don't, I don't know how to make this more clear, but that is, that is what changed my life. That took my life and just turned it into a totally different direction. And it's difficult for me to talk about because of just, just how feeble, you know, yeah, it was in the beginning. I just believed what they told me. I wouldn't stay sober if I didn't help others. I wouldn't stay sober. I would never get well. And so I tried, and uh, the effect produced was incredible, almost as incredible as the effect produced by drugs and alcohol. I felt free. We would walk around this crappy gym where they would, you know, they would crack the window, and that's the, that's the fresh air we would get. We would walk in circles for months, you know, and the faces would change, and the alcoholism was the same. We would walk around and we would talk about alcoholism and what we were going to do and what we were doing to recover, and we would talk about God. Um, I, and I found myself in short order in a place I had never been before. That, like, it didn't matter what my, my circumstances were. It didn't matter that I was probably going to go to prison. I was free. I had been let out of a cage that I didn't even know that I was in. Um, I was okay, you know, even though my life was a mess. And there was really no indication that it was ever going to get a great deal better because I had wrecked it. I didn't know if I would ever raise my children again. I didn't know how much time I would spend in prison. But I knew that all of the sudden I didn't have that voice with me anymore that talked incessantly about when are we going to get loaded again? When are we going to drink again? That voice had left me. Um, and I didn't know that that was possible. And beyond that, I was experiencing contentment and joy and usefulness. Um, <clears throat> And that kind of just, that was the anchor. The anchor went down, and I knew that this would, be the, this would be the basis of my life if I was to remain recovered. Because, you know, life goes on, and it doesn't matter how long we've been sober or what incredible experiences we've had in the past. Self will rally, and it'll reinsert itself into whatever crease it can find. And so running right next to self has to be a continuing, ongoing spiritual practice and spiritual work, the heart of which will be working with alcoholics intensively and offering them the same solution that we've been offered. Um, I haven't done a lot of things perfectly, but when I made that bargain with God in my third step, when I told him that if you keep me sober, I will do your work. If you make me well, I will work with others. I've done my utmost to hold up my end of that bargain. Um, and it's done everything for me. And I think that, like... It's really cool to talk about that here. The purpose of this, of this conference is to, is to discuss that, what it is that we're going about doing, what we're doing here in Alcoholics Anonymous, because it's not what I thought. It's not a self-help program. This isn't about me coming here so that I can get what I need from you. It's not about me coming here so that you can show me how to be okay and how to stay sober, even though that's part of it. This is about me coming here so that God can, can be rid of my self-centeredness through the sacrifice that I'll make in terms of being available to help help others like me. Um, we started, uh, some of the women that I sponsor, and I started a, a meeting that we do on Thursday nights. It's not really even a meeting. We get together, uh, and we read the big book together because uh, it's important. Um, and we really kind of just started it so that we would have a place where we could gather all, all of our new people together. And when we started, I think it was like three, three or four of us, <laughs> we would... We would meet, and we would just read together, <laughs> just read to each other. Would you like a turn, Lauren? And Lauren would read, and, you know, there was no one there. And we were, <laughs> 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 we, 
we were sitting in there last night and I looked around and there were, you know, there's 30 and 40 of us sometimes. And every week there's somebody new. And, and like, we're shoulder, these girls and I were shoulder to shoulder in this. And I could not have foreseen this, that this is like the center of my life, that this is the most incredible part of my life, how God works in us and through us and what God has given us to do together. Um, it's, it's remarkable. It's just, I just, there's no way for me to over, I can't possibly sell it. I can't explain how incredible it is. Because I always felt so alone, you know, just so separate from everybody. Disconnected from God, disconnected from others. I could be in a whole big group of people and I still felt all by myself. Not, you know. And uh, I feel anything but that today. I feel connected to everything. Um, and that's all because of God. And it's all contingent upon the, the maintenance and growth of my spiritual condition. It must continue. If it stops, I won't get to stay here. Um, and that's okay. I just feel it's so incredibly blessed and fortunate. It's just what, an inc- what a crazy thing to have, a, have a, a woman approach you with tears in her eyes and ask you for help. Uh, and then to watch her work with so many women. Um, and then to watch those women work with more women. And whatever, this isn't just for women. I'm just, I'm a woman. So. <laughs> uh, I don't work with you know men most of the time. Um, I think that I, I thought when I first came to AA that the twelve step work and work with others was kind of optional. It was a thing that I would I would get to when I get to the oh that's later. That's for when I have multiple years of sobriety because I certainly don't have anything to offer anybody. Um, I don't know how to do that. Other people can do that. I'll just you know I'll just be here and I'll do something else. Um, but that I wasn't given that option, and thank God for that. I'm very, very, very blessed that I had a sponsor who put a huge emphasis on work with others, who explained to me that the entire purpose of my spiritual work would be to pass it to someone else, that the entire purpose of my relationship with God would be to enable me to transmit a message to someone else like me. Um, And I found that at five, six weeks sober, I had something to offer, um, which was very surprising, uh, but it was real. (sighs) So I'm really glad that we have Peter here. I'm glad to hear him speak. I'm excited to hear what he has to say, and I'm excited for the workshop tomorrow. If you're new in here, we have a solution. Um, If you have alcoholism, there won't be a halfway one. There won't be a three-quarter way one. This is an all-or-nothing deal, but it works 100% of the time when you you work it. Um, spiritual, Spiritual experience are bust. There's a lot of people in the room who can offer sponsorship. That was a, a big deal for me. Right away, I needed to get a sponsor from whom I would take direction. Um, Changed my life. I owe my life to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm very, very grateful to be here and be sober. Thank you so much.